awesome addition, and she's going to talk to us about something that's near and dear to her family in her. Can you hear me? Is it loud enough? Is it too loud? Because I can talk really loud. Um, She's a teacher. <laughs> yeah, if I can entertain, keep teenagers engaged. <laughs> this is the story. Okay, we'll see if I drop it. This is the story of the Cornelius family cabin. And I want to thank you for asking me to do this. It's awesome. I'm, I'm just excited. So thank you for, for being here. Um, first, I should say Milton Cornelius is here. And he's going to chime in with stories because he has, I'm sure, a lot more stories than I do. He's one generation ahead of me. <laughs> and his sister Marilyn. And then Megan showed up, but she probably doesn't want me to point that out. <laughs> My daughter Megan. Okay, so this is the Cornelius family. It's the ancestral home of the John Cornelius family in Jackson County. I think we all have very similar backgrounds. A lot of us came as immigrants from another country. There's Scandinavian people here. I need to turn it off. He says he can't hear you well. Huh? He says he can't hear you well. I don't think that's working. Um. I'll just hold this. Is that better? Can you hear me? How about you people back there? Can you hear or no? How about yes. this? Yeah. And I'll just stay. Okay. So, yeah, I can hear me too. Is everybody awake? Do you have to stay behind that speaker up there or a squeal? Stay here. Yes. Oh, so you I can't wander around. Okay. So if you have ever been to Living History Farms, I would encourage you to go. Because when I went, you start at the Indians and you go through to the 1850s log cabin. And I saw our cabin when I went through there. And then if you go through, you go to the 1920s farm. And they were using the hay bay the hay tines, the hay forks that we used when I was a child. And my dad would pull the horses to put the hay into the barn. And he just remembered he was so little, he had to move fast to keep the horse from walking on him. <laughs> They're very quiet work horses. So if you go there, I think you're going to see your own history as well as ours. So when I talk about this, I think this is just a common thing for many of us older fa farm families in the area. This is John Cornelius. He is, this is a picture in 1868. He came to the United States in 1867. He came June 23rd, 1867 to Castle Garden, New York City, which is another port other than Ellis Island. He became a citizen in October of 1878, and he was born June 22nd, 1846 at Uterellen, Saxe Weaver, Dash Epsonach, or Germany, and that's near Eisenach. So he married Marth Anka Marita Johnson, or Anna, Grandma Annie. Yeah, that's right. And in St. Donatus, and he died September or December 20th, 1930, at the age of 84. So he lived a good long life. I think his wife outlived him a little bit. At one point, he he made another trip back to Germany to encourage his brothers and sisters to come. And eventually they did come with their families. They, their families were established in Germany. But he made sure that he was a US citizen before he came because he went with someone else and they had a hard time getting out of Germany. So he, he was smart in that way and made sure that he could get back. This is just a picture of a, any old immigration boat. And this is the ship's manifest of when they docked in New York. And his name is right there. And the man who wrote all that was really sloppy because if you look over there, it's J-O-H Cornelius. So, you know, it took me a little bit to realize, but the, everything else lines up. He came over on the Maryland. 
In the first years, he came to Bellevue, and he was a wagon ma maker in Bellevue. He made cabinets and a cabinet maker when he moved to Andrew. He was pretty handy. He lived in Andrew. He built a house in Andrew, and I can tell you, I think exactly where it is, is where Whitmore's house is, as near as I could tell. And that I, remember, I vaguely remember that house standing there, and then Ed and Betty Whitmore built a new house on that land. So uh, that was kind of a... That was something I discovered. In 1873, he built a cabin by Brush Trick. And you can see below here what we've got. In, I just don't have my pointer. In the front there, you can, you can see the feed bunk, and you can see a level area, and it goes down, and then there's a wide grassy spans toward the creek. Okay, this is if you're coming from Andrew up, it's before you get to that big rock cut. It's off to the left. So Chuck and I were, we were out there, there was, there was a beaver dam out there, and so they showed me exactly where it was. And so this is the post that was the border between the farms, John Cornelius' farm and Uncle Bill's farm. And, and that post is still standing. I just took this picture a little bit ago, a couple weeks ago, I guess it's September. And Chuck told me that Floyd brought you out, Milton. You and Chuck came out. Floyd showed you exactly where the cabin was. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, I think that will, if Will has anything to do about that, post will stay there forever. But the creek was a lot closer to the, to the bluff at that time. Because over 150 years, you know, it just kept moving that way. So that, that's a fun thing to know, because we never really knew. In 1883, they moved up the hill to a cabin that was already built. Um, this cabin, Milton was just telling me today that there wasn't a second floor. Because we, only, we only moved one story. When they moved in, um, they had like four pins or something, maybe five. And, and, uh, and, and I didn't see it here. Then what they did is they added two logs on the top to make, make it higher, and then they built a loft inside so the kids had a place to sleep. <laughs> and eventually they put a ceiling in there. Uh, I'm going to get heavy a little bit here. That's okay. Uh, when my uncle Paul, which is John's grand granddaughter's husband, uh, he took pieces of metal, aluminum, and for instance, if this, this was the east side, this would be E1, E1 south, E1 north. So if every log was numbered. Took them all apart, put them on a truck, put them down here, and put them back together in the same place. Yeah, yeah. There were many additions to this lot, with the large kitchen being what was remembered the most, as I read through some of our, our stories from, well, Augie Cornelius Lutch, her husband did the medals. She wrote quite a bit of information. So, we have a couple family stories that are kind of fun. This one I'm just going to read. It's from, it kind of became a Bible. Wayne Cornelius wrote this. He compiled everything that Augie had written and added a few things. So I'm just going to read the story of the arsenic. John and Anna Cornelius had with them at home this day six of their children, except John Jr., perhaps Lena. They were both over 21 years of old by this time. And apparently 11-year-old Fred, who's Milton's grandfather, was working, was, told his children in later years that he was away from home working when this incident happened. Willie and Charlie were sure, Charlie's my grandfather, great grandfather, were surely helping John with field work in that year. The other boys, Louis, Henry, and Albert, were clearly too young to work in the fields. Mother Anna was somewhat sight impaired by this time, apparently with cataracts, yet she still had enough sight and familiarity with her kitchen to cook for her family. One of the older boys, who liked to fish, we think it was Willie, found himself in need of a bait can and went to the kitchen to find one. 
On a shelf in the cupboard, he saw two baking powder cans, both with quite a bit less than full of white powder. He saw no reason not to pour the powder from one can into the other, freeing one for his use. Of course, he did not realize he was mixing cream of tartar with arsenic. The borrowed can was apparently never missed. The cream of tartar was, of course, used in everyday cooking, practically everything baked from scratch those days. Arsenic might have been on hand for use as for rodents and insecticide and what we use it for now. So it was that on this May afternoon, John and the two boys were working a field somewhat remote from the house. Mother Anna baked a cake as a treat. Milton remembers it as being chocolate, although he didn't live then. <laughs> and so while it was still fresh and warm, she, Anna took it to the field for the workers. The pain and retching of the poison began to affect them even before Anna left to return for, to the house. Curiously, Charlie was noticeably less sick than anyone else. It was realized that Charlie, although he had about the same amount of lunch as the others, started out with a fuller stomach. He was hungry, so he visited a tame cow in the adjacent pasture and snacked on about a quart of warm milk. Those in the house, Mother Anna and the younger boys, must have also reserved some of that for their dinner because, as the Bellevue leader reported, the entire family had fallen ill. John was the first to guess at what had happened to them and to take action. Sick though he was, he walked to the nearest neighbor in the valley to get help. Farmers did not have telephones in those days, so the neighbor rode into Andrew to fetch a physician. The doctor, however, was not available at once, so Mr. Bruckner, the local druggist, picked up an emetic drug and went to the Cornelius farm by horse and buggy. By the grace of God, he was in time to help, and by the time the physician got there, Dr. Littlefield, he was able to, they were already recovering. By the time, a week later, that the newspaper printed the story, only Mrs. Cornelius was still confined to bed. I mean, that could have wiped out a whole generation. So, and then, there was the rattlesnake story. Apparently, Grandma Anna had Willie on a blanket out in the front yard, and she was working in the garden. She also had the lunch that she was going to take to the field beside Willie. She came back to check on Willie, and there was a rattlesnake just munching on that lunch, not paying any attention to the baby. She killed the rattlesnake, and it had about 23 rattles. But then Milton has a story about a mouse that I'm not sure I've heard. Well, it must have been after the loft was built, but uh, Anna was cooking some soup on the, on the stove, you know, the old cast iron wood stove. And all of a sudden she heard a splash and she looked in the soup and there was a mouse there. <laughs> just fell off the loft. The she just picked the mouse up, tossed it outside, kept water on cooking the soup. And she didn't hurt anybody. <laughs> Well, she was boiling, I'm sure. <laughs> and so she killed all the jerks. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> but we all have so many stories that are just passed down through the generation. Um, also, no, I have the same picture. I'm right. I've got it here. As his brothers and sisters came, he had gone back to Germany to encourage them to become. And as they came, he either housed them, I believe, down in the cabin by Brush Creek, or in his own home. So he was very good about helping his brothers and sisters get started. Memories of growing up. This is the house that I was, I would lived in until I was about 13, because. Um, The cabin portion is right here. This was what we called the washroom. And we had a washer and dryer in there. We had a big cupboard that my other grandfather had made that had all the canned goods in it. We had a chest freezer. We had an upright freezer. Um, there was a table back there and storage. But it was not heated very well, if at all. So we didn't really live in the cabin portion. And upstairs, 
would have been right there that Milton was talking about. That was our attic. So, um, so that was really not used for living. But back here, it goes, it goes back quite a ways. I think it was probably a first edition, and that was a kitchen and a bedroom, and there's a bathroom there and a closet and stairs going upstairs. And there were two big bedrooms upstairs. And then this, from here out, was I think probably built later. I, I'm just guessing because as I remember living there, and to get it, this was my room on top. It was huge. I mean, it had pink linoleum with big flower bouquets on it, and we had two single beds and a guest bed and a dresser and a walk-in closet. I mean, it's crazy large, and the living room was large too. So that section, and I had a step. There was a step up into my room. And there's a little bit of an unevenness in the litter. So I kind of think that might have been a third edition or second edition. But anyway, you come up the stairs and you come into a hallway. The, one of the bedrooms was a storeroom they had built. And then you could go into my brother's room, which was over the kitchen. And there was another door going into the attic. And in the attic, there was a back stairs. So, you know, we, when mom cleaned the attic, you could actually get through it and down the stairs. So we just kind of run around there, up one stairs and down the other, but it was kind of fun. This is where the well was, so this is when they were probably pulling the pump. It has to be like 19, middle 60s, early 60s. And it cracks me up that the cat is in there. <laughs> Here you see the south end, and you can see the house in 1968. Julie looks to be about three or four. She was born in 1965. Mom and Dad and Chuck and Julie and Nancy and Mom's beautiful flowers. She had lots of beautiful flowers. <laughs> Up here on the other side of the cabin is a lean-to back porch. And in that porch was a big cement area and then the cellar steps went down under the kitchen. And in the basement there was a huge wood-burning furnace and a coal furnace. It was kind of together, and we had a big room for coal and a root cellar and all that kind of stuff. But in the winter, Chuck and I would have to carry in piles of wood because Dad would bring in the wood for the winter and pile it in the backyard, and you know, it's not a job. Well, I didn't like it at all, and I don't think Chuck really liked it either. And you know, we'd be prying them apart with a crowbar because it froze. <laughs> And we'd be out there doing it because we didn't do it before. And then in the summer, we had a, a shower out there. They'd clean it all up and they'd have a shower. So, yeah, lots of memories. There's two elm trees there. One is still standing. I think the one on the left is still standing. The other one... Well, as I think about it, I don't know. But one of them is still standing, and you can tell where the old front yard was when we were little, because there's another tree on the other side. And you can, between where the garage is and where the trees are, you can tell where the, ca the cabin actually stood. Um, yeah, lost it. Okay, so preserving the cabin. In 1972, they pulled up, okay, what happened in 1972 was that mom woke up to a house full of smoke. And if any of you know Wanda, kids get out, get out, she, you know, she goes into that, that mode she has of emergency. But what it turned out was that a pipe had just found out and we had black smoke all over the house. And, you know, that's a mess to clean up. And we had old wiring and old furnace. And, you know, to remodel that house was not cost effective. So what they did is they decided to build a new house. And they built the house portion. Three feet, away, three feet to the east. I don't know if you can even right here. So there was three feet between the old house and our new house. And we'd have to go over and practice the piano because, you know, it was a big piano. That, that was the new house, not counting the garage. 
Right, just the new house part. Okay, right. So then they tore down the old house and left the cabin standing. And they built the breezeway in the garage. So before they started tearing it down, they pulled some some planks off the side of the, the, the lower corner here, and the logs were rotten. And they thought, oh no, is the whole thing going to be going to be rotten, and it turns out it was in perfect condition all but that corner. So we moved in 1973, tore it down, built a breezeway and garage, and then they moved the, the cabin. Oh, I forgot to point out. This is Wilson's old boom truck. Do you still have that truck? No. <laughs> <laughs> I still have the ditch witch. <laughs> Yeah, they stopped pulling pumps a long time ago. <laughs> and I don't know if you were pulling the pump or not in the 60s, but he might have been. And that's, this is a younger Milton right here, as far as I can tell. Yep, Wilson and Milton, they were just so helpful, and they just took it by the horns, too. It was just an awesome family. When the family got together, there were lots of people there. It was... You know, and I was 13 and just go, whoa. And those that didn't sent money to help. And then as they moved it to the historical society, I believe some of the some of the things from the house came back. And so there's several Cornelius artifacts in there. A lot of them, though, are just things from the date. Here's just some more photographs of the teardown. I mean, the views from this hill are just amazing. So they got it to the fairgrounds, but whoever was president of the Historical Society Board, I guess, passed away. And so it took another year to get it redone. And many of you probably remember it being on the corner, the southeast corner of the fairgrounds. And um, yeah, it looked really nice there, but as time went on, it got so that it was getting rotten, the roof was shot. And so the decision was made to move it. And this was my dad's decision. Well, I don't know if it was all. But he, but he decided it was needed to be moved somewhere else. So they poured the floor for the machine shed. And in September of 1995, they picked it up with a crane, a huge crane, and it went through the air across the, fire, across the fairgrounds and was set on that cement pad. And I was there. It was pretty cool. <laughs> and then they built the machine shed around it. So that's how it came to be there. Um, Dad, and I'm just going to say Dad paid for the whole thing. He lined everything up in September of 1995. And it was something he had to get done, and he passed away in, in December. So it was like his, you know, and he, he was sick with chemo, and he was out there directing the whole thing, and he's, you know, he was quite a quite an inspiration to a lot of people. So, but he wanted this preserved badly. So here it is inside the fairground. Um, this would be the part that faced east toward the front yard. That's the inside of it. Over there was that door that faced south. It's now a fireplace, which I would imagine there was a fireplace right there back in the day. And they put a door in and took that out. And the steps going upstairs were in this corner, and they went up and around. These are just more pictures of the, the interior. I will point out that the, the table that's in there, you can see it there, that actually came from the staying cabin right before Pioneer Day. And is Bonnie? Where's Bonnie? Oh, she's right there. So was that? Tell me the story just quickly. The so one that the shape that's in here today came from the Allen Cabin in Leisure Lake. Allen Cabin in Leisure Lake. Tom's Allen Cabin covered with water when Leisure Lake was flooded. So that is that is from there. And it is a, it is authentic to the time period. So that is a great acquisition. I mean, that is just awesome. 
So you have a rope bed and an ironing board and a rocking chair and a table and you know a spinning wheel. But I will say that bag with the blue flowers on is not from that time period. It's this one. <laughs> I didn't even realize it was there when I took the picture. <laughs> Don't think that's not authentic. <laughs> okay, so that, that kind of tidies up the cabin story. But just a little bit about German ancestry. We came from Eisenach, Germany at the base of the Wartburg Castle. That is where Martin Luther translated the Bible from Hebrew into Greek and... German. Germany. So it's right here, kind of in central Germany, south of Hamburg. And then this is a this is a little map of Eisenach or Utrellen. Eisenach. Yeah. Anyway, this is where supposedly the Cornelius house was, right there. We have a relative, he was Dr. Eugene Cornelius. He was the son of the youngest Cornelius son who went to Canada. And he actually went to Germany in the 80s before the wall came down and went to Eisenach and did a lot of research. He came back to one of our reunions and just had an amazing program of the research he had done over there. So some of what I'm gonna show you now is the research that he did. Martin, it's 85% Lutheran there, and I think it still is as I was researching it. We have that generation, my dad's generation, and the one before him had a lot of Lutheran ministers in the family. It, it was a very, very Christian family, a very Lutheran family. So, I mean, that's just a heritage that has come down through the years for the most part. He was able to trace back to the Cornelius family at Unterellen, and he got all the way back to Christoph Stoffel Cornelius, born in 1635. They don't know where. And he married Gertrude. Gertrude. They don't know who she was. They're not sure when she was born. She died about 1714. <laughs> you know, women were just, you know. But... Um, the Schaffenmeister of dem Roggenschem Luthi, something about a wagon master, I think. I think he was a wagon master. But that, that's kind of interesting as well. So this is the family that lived in the cabin. It has everyone but the youngest two boys. We have Fred, which is Milton's grandfather. Well, in the Okay, so we have Fred, and this is Lewis. He's the one who owned the cabin after. He's the one who bought that farm from his father. Annie, this is Charles, Carl Jacob, which is Charlie, who was my great-grandfather. Notice how straight he stands. You'll see in the next picture, he's still standing straight, and I have pictures of him as an old man singing in German, standing straight like that. I, I hadn't noticed that. John Cornelius... Over here we have Anna and Lena, and I have to look. John Jr. and Uncle, well, we call him Uncle Bill, but he's William. So the older show girls got married, and I think they lived in Andrew. Anna Summer and Lena Kyle. Lena, Lena married a Kyle, and if you remember Argo Kyle and his son Dennis and Roger Kyle, they're all from, from that sibling. So we used to go over to Ardo and Elsie's for dinner because they knew each other well, Grandpa and my Grandpa Gilbert. Ardo and Roger were there moving the cabin. Yeah, Ardo and Roger were there moving the cabin. I'm sh yeah, I have no doubt. Yeah, very fine people. Yeah, Cap Summers. Cap, okay, Cap Summers would be Lena's son. son. Annie's son. Yeah, Annie. Annie's son. And I think did that, and that so that that was eventually became Summers with the S on the end. Yeah, but it was Cap Summers there. Um, John Jr. went to South Dakota. I know that we kept in touch with them for a long time. We we still sell corn in South Dakota in Canton out there. So we kept in touch that way. <coughs> As one, the, one of one of John's kids' daughters married a man. 
70s, there were like 30 or 40 Maynard cousins that would go around the church. Yes. Do you remember that? 30 or 40 Maynard cousins. They have a large family, and they were out there, and um, they formed a singing group. Kind of, if you think of Up With People, and they toured around, and they came to Andrew, and they were amazing. We had two of the twins. Um, the yeah. twins stayed with us. Well, we had four of the boys in our house. Mary, Mary Ellen's. Mary Ellen's. And then I remember one time in Wyoming, we went to see Mildred Enix. They had a wheat, wheat ranch and a wheat farm in Wyoming. And I think that was part of that clan. No, was that part of that clan? It, it's really hard when you were young. Because now, of course, everybody is. is yes. Our picture, like that says, there was also another child, Mary. Mary died in infancy. So she no, she would not be there. I kind of, I need to put that on there because I have it in my notes. Okay, so we continue on here. This is Uncle Bill. He bought the farm from his father just west, which is what we call Uncle Bill's farm, <laughs> which is where the cabin was. And if you look across the road, there's that bottom. That's Willie's bottom. You know, that's a generational difference. I, I didn't know him as Uncle Bill. It was Uncle Willie. Uncle yeah. Willie. That, that was uh, Floyd and Wilbur's dad. Yeah, Floyd, yeah, thank you. I meant to say that. Floyd and Wilbur, and I think most of you know them, and Joel. John is now in DeWitt. The other ones are, are scattered. Wilbur's children are not around anymore. Francis has passed. And then we come over here to Charlie. He bought the farm just north where Lawrence and Evelyn lived. And Kevin lived there. <coughs> And then eventually my grandparents bought, about, bought his farm south, I think from Grandpa Charlie. And this was kind of a pattern in our family. They bought farms from their fathers. And, and it's, it's been the same on the way down. Um, then we have Fred. Fred was a county supervisor for how many years? Oh, 40s and 50s and then he, then he was out for a while and then in the early 60s it was again for a couple of years. Yeah. Long time. Yeah, and of course his son was Wilson. They had a farm that was just north of us. Andre Diaquisto lives there now. Um, that house, the story is they ra they raised the roof and put a second floor in that house. <laughs> so that was always a family lore story as well. So these people were all nestled around us. And then Lewis bought the family farm, but eventually he did leave for California when he sold it to Emil and Emma Kruger, which was family. And then, I guess that covers all of them. And then the two youngest, Albert and Henry, were born later. They went to Canada to Saskatchewan. And I didn't know why they went, but someone said there was some sort of a homesteading incentive to go to Canada. And I, was just, I went over this with my mother-in-law just before this, I went out there. And she said that Grandma Schmidt's brother or sister also went to Canada, to Saskatchewan. So I'm wondering if there were a lot of families who had sons and daughters go to Canada under this homesteading program. What time period would that have been? What time? How old were they? Well, they would have been about in their 20s when they went to Canada. So what year would that have been? I'm going to say probably... 1920. That was going to be my guess, too. Give or, give or take 10 years, 1920. Yeah. So, and I think that's what Babe and I decided also. This is, these are the Cornelius brothers. John Jr. had bought a car, and they took a picture. So here you have my grandfather, Charlie. Look how, look how straight and tall he's standing. Um, John Jr. is driving. In the back is Fred. Fred, Fred doesn't look like the other ones. He, he, you notice how his hair is parted in the middle? Yeah. That's how you can tell it was Fred. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He does have the looks, but he just, he just always looked a little different. And then we have, oh shoot, what have I got over there? Lewis. Lewis. 
who bought the farm, and I should know that because I've got a later picture. And there we have, have Uncle Willie, Uncle Bill, and look at how handsome he was. That's Floyd's father. <laughs> and then next to him is Henry and Albert right here, and they, they're the two that went to Canada. The family values of the Cornelius family still show today. I mean, Milton and Marilyn and Megan, they all have these same values. Lutheran re religious values, church was always a big part of our lives. They had initiative and they were aggressive. I don't know about aggressive, but if they saw something needed to be done, they did it. If they saw something was wrong, they fixed it. And I think John Cornelius could have been a little outspoken on some of that stuff. <laughs> But he made things happen. Uprightness, which is, I had to look that up, is honesty. And, and that has come through very much. They believe that being honest is much better than anything. And I can remember when my dad was running for office, there were more than one person that said he was too honest to run for office. <laughs> Hard working. We worked all the time. Milton works all the time. You still kind of do. <laughs> One time I went up to church and he and Duane were digging up the floor in the church, the cement. They set off the fire alarm. <laughs> I mean, they just find things to do, and, you know. Independent, frugal, and thrifty. Oh, yeah. They did not waste money. In the cow yard one day, I found a, a penny dated 1879. I just looked at it the other day. Oh, I took a picture. I was going to put it in there. I am thinking, it was either a penny or a dime, and somebody got in big trouble for losing that, I'm pretty sure. It was just late, laying there in the mud, it had come up. It was a muddy day. This is my dad and Uncle Paul. And I, I'm not sure who's behind there. Could, I think it kind of looks like Grandpa Gilbert, because he did wear this. And the tall guy must have been the hired man, because he is way too tall to be a Cornelius. <laughs> they were not known for height. <laughs> and then pal, the collie. I know, it might be the first pal, I'm not sure. I don't know how, would that have been Larry Brockman? Larry Brockmeyer? Brockmeyer? That's what I was thinking. Was he tall? I don't remember. Larry was tall and skinny like that. Then I bet that's who it is. I bet it is. And I just remember, he, he lived with Grandma and Grandpa, so, and she had to change her cha chamber pot because he was older, and... You know, he stayed in the one bedroom upstairs, and he milked the cow, and I remember that. And I remember sitting at dinner with him when I'd be at Grandma's. But I don't remember what he looked like. I don't know if I can describe him, but I knew him fairly well. And you think? In 42, he was helping build the Alcan Highway. The Alcan Highway in 1942. The highway up to Alaska. Oh, the highway up to Alaska. Yeah, he worked. He was a worker, and he was fun. But yeah, I, that's got that's who I thought that had to be. But I just didn't know. That'd be about the right time. If, 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 uh, that's your dad. Mm -hmm. So I was probably late forties. Sorry, was still around in the middle fifties. Yeah. Well, no, he retired, and then he would bring us Milky Ways and, go, and Juicy Fruit Gum and come visit. <laughs> Well, when he was he was in the nursing, or I, he was in assisted living type, I, one of those I, houses. I remember him, he'd come in to in the in like 57, 58. Yeah. yeah. Well, see, I was born in 59, and he was still working there, but he was older. Yeah. Yeah. In, in 1967, we had a centennial reunion, 100 years since John Cornelius landed in New York. There's four branches to our family. The descendants of Elizabeth Cornelius Gable, they had a farm south. We used to haul hay into the Gable barn after Dad bought that, or Grandma and Grandpa did. Conrad W. Cornelius, they had a farm. That would be Ronnie Cornelius, Ronnie and Elaine, Viola Wallace, Judy and, Judy and Carl Ganser, Milo and Flossie. That is in the Conrad branch. Yeah. And they're, they're just right southwest of us. Um, Margaret Cornelius Hildebrand, that is the branch of the family that includes the Peters family, 
Floyd, Lucille Debbie, Floyd Peters, and Elmer Peters. So their shirt tail ref, their shirt tail relation as well. Their house is up. I believe that I'm just putting this all together, but I think where Floyd lived north of us, that must have been the home Hildebrand place. You think so? Yeah, I think so. So, and then the John Cornelius branch. So they all came from Germany one at a time and they settled around and John helped them get settled. Oh wait. Two sisters and one brother up to 1888. Um, so there were 193 people here, it was at our house. It was chaos, and mom was just cleaning everything and trimming everything and cleaning the house twice, three times, and getting everything ready, and it really went well. It was a fun day. But you you were in the you were in the service. Yeah. Yeah. Where were you then? Washington D.C. She Washington D.C. Milton has a story he could tell you someday too. Um. So we took the big picture, it was in the paper, the whole bit. So the owners of the cabin were John Sr. in 1883. Louis Cornelius, his son, um, he bought it. I didn't get the date. It's, we have all the abstracts available, but I didn't look it up. Then he sold it to Emma and Emil Kruger, which would have been my grandfather's sister, his niece and his niece. Then Gerald and Wanda Cornelius bought it in 1950. Eight, 15, no, in the 60s, because they rented for a while. They rented the farm. And that was, that was a crazy process, too. But then, when Mom passed away, she still owned it, and Chuck passed it through to Will. Will ended up north of the highway. J.C. James ended up south of the highway. So that's who owns it now, and he's really, really into this family history stuff. They're all gone to a sales meeting, and so they aren't here. Otherwise, I, I think Will would have come for sure. So this picture I put in last night, this is Uncle Lewis who owned that farm, holding my father. So he would eventually own that farm. Isn't, that, isn't he just adorable? <laughs> but if you look at, at, at Jerry compared to Uncle Lewis, they don't look alike. That's because Dad's brother Paul is a Cornelius. Dad is a Wilcox. And I just ran across some pictures that really prove that. He looks just like his mother. But anyway, I just thought that was a pretty, pretty neat picture. So in, a couple of years ago, we were designated a heritage farm. It was, it was in August after Mom had died in June. She and Will worked hard on that application to get the right evidence together. And so it was kind of a bittersweet day without her, but she would have been pretty excited. And it's always fun to go to the state fair. Just about everybody was there, too. And then Chuck has a real interest in preserving. He has a schoolhouse, which is another presentation in itself. But that's a schoolhouse where everybody went to school. The Peterses, the Kilbergs, the um, dad and Uncle Paul. And they're in the area. Donnie Rowling. And um, it's right there by Grandma's old house where the new office is. And it's by Chuck's house. He built a house over here. So he, had, he restored all of that. My grandmother had saved everything she possibly could. Some people had taken things when the school closed. And those things slowly filtered back when Chuck redid it. So, you know, he bought very little. He bought some desks. But most everything came back because you take something like that with you, the Victrola, the, the bird song records, and you have them and you like them, but they're just there. And so they, they all came back. Even the wood box came back. Grandma had a wood box in her garage, and I thought it looked very farmhousey. So then I put it in my garage, you know, and didn't do anything with it. And so then I said, Chuck, you need to have this wood box. And they had a reunion there of people who went to that school, and somebody walked in the door and said, oh, they even have the old wood box. <laughs> I'm glad I kept it. But anyway, that, that's a whole story on its own. And then this is 
My grandmother lived there right by the seed house there. We tore that house down. Chuck did a couple years ago. And he did, sit, that had a cabin in it as well. And so he moved it over to his house right next to the schoolhouse. So that's his next project. I think he already fixed the, the roof maybe. And I'm not sure either, but. So it carries on and Will has a tremendous interest in all of this family history. He took all the things from moms. I took the things from grandma when she passed because I was in charge of cleaning that up at the end. <laughs> and Will was kind of in charge since he got her house. He's, it's not done yet, but it's close. So he has a lot of that family history stuff now. And he's just thrilled to have it. So this is the end. Do you have anything to add? Um, so thank you for being such a good audience. The Historical Society was so wonderful in 1973 to move it down and help put it back up. And it's now preserved as a part of family history. So we forever will thank the Historical Society for taking an interest in this. But the biggest thing about moving is it's not about us. It's about you because I'm sure we all have very similar histories. I said that in the beginning and I'll say it again. We all are cut from a lot of the same cloth. There's quite a few people from Scandinavia, not as many as in central Iowa, and I think it's, it, there's a lot of German heritage around here. So it's pretty exciting that this all unites us now. So with that, that's the end of this presentation. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So thank you, Nancy. And just so you know, Nancy's going to be doing another. Oh, I'm playing here next month. <laughs> <laughs> so Deb and her committee is planning our next fundraiser, which is called Spring Has a Name. She can't remember the name either. <laughs> it's the 30th of March. It's going to be a pasta bake right here. And the Tuesday, it's a Thursday night, the Tuesday before, brown bag lunch. Nancy's going to do her hat program. She's famous for her hats. Actually, I don't think it's going to be quite so much my traditional program as going through some of the hats that are here at the Storm Society and just doing kind of a history of costume type of thing. i got to leave you wanting more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We, we appreciate her. So don't forget, next week it's the A-Team from Preston, and you won't want to miss that. Thank you all for coming. Have a great day.